I want to thank all of you for being here this morning, uh, especially uh, if you're a guest. We know that we have a lot of guests this morning. We're so appreciative of your being here. And uh, if you're in the area visiting with family, uh, we welcome you here to worship with us. If you're from the community, we welcome you back to worship with us at any time. We're just glad you're here today. This morning, I would like to talk about the importance of the resurrection. I want to begin by reading from Acts, the second chapter, beginning in verse 22. And this is found in uh, the first recorded gospel sermon in all the New Testament. Peter preaching said this, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. There's probably more people thinking about the resurrection this morning than any other time during the year. And so that's a good enough reason for me to talk about the resurrection. The resurrection was the centerpiece of apostolic preaching. Uh, they were witnesses of the resurrection. You couldn't be an apostle unless you were the witness of the resurrection. And they went forth and they taught it. In Acts 3, in the second recorded sermon, beginning in verse uh, 14, Paul, or Peter again, says, But you disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murder to be granted to you. You put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact that we are witnesses. And so they witnessed this. And you read all through the book of Acts, and there are at least nine places in the book of Acts where this is emphasized in the lessons and the sermons that the, uh, in the early apostolic church. The resurrection is just as important today as it was in the first century. And I'm going to explore the importance of it. Uh, and I wish to do this with the first 19 verses of uh, the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. The first letter to the Corinthian church was written uh, for the purpose of correcting certain problems that were there and answering certain questions that the Corinthians seemed to be very confused about. Now, the Corinthians had a problem concerning the resurrection, and this problem was that there was some false teaching being done about it. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12, it says, If Christ has preached that he has uh, been raised, from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? So there were some people in Corinth that were saying, there is no resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is not going to happen. And then those that were uh, questioning, them, many of them were questioning if there really was a resurrection, how was it going to happen? Uh, and they had questions concerning a bodily resurrection in verse 35. So someone will say, how are the dead raised and what kind of body will they come? Now, Corinth was in Greece, and Greek philosophy uh, concerning death was that the body was the prison house of the soul, and that death was a release of the soul from captivity. So to the Greek, a bodily resurrection was a calamity rather than a blessing. It was against all sound philosophy to teach this uh, to the Greeks. Paul was ridiculed in Athens for teaching the resurrection when he stood before the uh, philosophers of the Areopagus. In Acts 17, <coughs> excuse me, Acts 17, 32, he said, Now when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, and others said, We will hear you again concerning this. But this didn't stop Paul. Paul preached the resurrection as a proof of the judgment, of the fact that there proof there would be a judgment. In Acts 17, 30 and 31, he said, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. 
So he says this is the proof that there will be a resurrection and a judgment. People today have the same problem the Greeks did in Paul's day. Applying current philosophy to biblical teaching and coming up with the wrong answers. Paul warned the Colossians about doing this, about mixing uh, philosophy and mixing it with the gospel and coming up with the wrong answers. In Colossians 2, 6, he said, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. He said you can't mix these worldly philosophies into the gospel because you'll come out with something different. So I will look at Paul's answer to the resurrection problem among the Corinthians who were denying actually that there was one. And I want to look at two things as I do that this morning. First of all, evidences for a resurrection and the consequences for denying a resurrection. Let's begin by looking at some of the evidences for a resurrection. Paul makes three arguments uh, for the resurrection, in favor of the resurrection, against the false teacher that call rent, and he does this in the first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 15. His first argument was that salvation depends on a resurrection. In the first four verses here, he said, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, uh, which also you received, in which you stand by which you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you have believed in vain. So Paul reminds them again that he had preached the gospel to them and that they had accepted it and it was the foundation upon which their salvation uh, was based and which the church rested. They were saved by it unless they turned away from it, unless they received it in a vain way, in a useless way and had turned away from it. So he said, what is this gospel? He goes on to say it was the good news about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's what the gospel's all about. Verse 3, he said, I delivered to you as of first importance. He said, this is the most the, the important thing, the most important thing I taught you. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Why was this the first importance? because if this was not true, then nothing else really mattered. This had to be true before the other things became important. This was what they had obeyed whenever they were saved. Uh, Paul taught them the same thing he taught the Romans, or uh, that he wrote to the Romans, and he wrote to the Roman church concerning this in Romans 6 and verse 3. And he said, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized have been baptized into his death? And he said, goes on to say, therefore we have been buried with him through death, uh, with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk, Ray, be raised to walk in newness of life. So the very act of uh, obeying Christ in baptism is in his death, burial, and resurrection. Paul had not invented this idea. It was according to the scriptures. It was according to Old Testament prophecy. It had been prophesied. Uh, notice what he says here. Christ died for our sins in verse 3. If you go back to Isaiah 53 and verse 5, he said, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. And then he goes on to say, therefore I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong, because he has poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He was crucified between uh, two thieves. And he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. So it was prophesied that he would die for our sins. And then that he was buried in Isaiah 53, 9, said his grave was assigned with wicked men. And yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. So he was put in a rich man's tomb, as you well know. And then the psalmist talks about the resurrection in Psalm 116, or Psalm 16, rather, in verse 10. He said, For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither wilt thou allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. And this was what Peter preached as proof of the resurrection. 
in the very first sermon that we looked at a few minutes ago. Let's go back to uh, Acts 2 and verse 24. It said that God raised him up, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. And then in verse 27, he said, Because thou wilt not abandon thy soul to Hades, nor allow thy holy one to undergo decay. And he used this psalm as proof that this was a fulfillment of the resurrection. So his first argument then was that this is the way you were saved. Your salvation was based on Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and this is what you obeyed in order to have salvation. And then the second argument that he makes is living witnesses in verse 5 through 8 as we go back to 1 Corinthians verse 15. He said, And he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at once, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So what's he saying there? First he said, Christ appeared to Cephas. Well, that's Simon Peter. That's another name for Simon Peter. Uh, you can read about that in Luke 24, 33, and 34. I'm not going to go there. Uh, and a number of other scriptures. And then he said that Christ appeared to the 12 apostles. Uh, this was in John 26, uh, 20, John 20, uh, 26 through 28. And that was when Thomas was there. And Thomas then believed because he saw Jesus from the resurrection. And then he said in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 6 that I just read that he appeared to over 500 at one time. And he said most of those 500 people are still alive. A few of them have died or asleep, as he called it. But most of them are still alive and still talking about this. And then he appeared to James, that is the Lord's brother, who was an unbeliever until after the resurrection. In John 7, 5, it said, for even his brothers were not believing in him. And last of all, he said, Christ appeared to him, to Paul, as one born out of season. You can read about that in Acts 9, the first 18 verses, and when Paul retells it in Acts 22, verses 1 through 21, which I'm not going to go. But I'm going to point out that living witnesses, over nearly 500 or possibly 500 living witnesses were still alive that saw Jesus after the resurrection. That's his second argument. And the third argument that there was a resurrection was that Paul preached the same gospel as the other apostles. Some had attacked Paul's apostleship because he was not one of the original 12, that he had been converted later on. Well, first he persecuted the church, and then he was converted later on as an apostle to the Gentiles, which he did. And Paul's defense is on the grounds of revelation that God uh, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, as you read in Acts 9, and that God appeared to him and revealed other things to him. And also the fruit of his works. In verse 9 and 10, he said, I am the least of the apostles who am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove in vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God uh, with me. And he said, because of God's grace, because God had mercy on me, he made me what I am. And, I, and because of that, I've labored more and harder than all the rest of them put together. And he said, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. So he's saying, I preach the same thing as the other apostles, whether it's me or whether it's them. We both preach the same gospel. We both preach. We all preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as you read through the gospels, you'll find this to be true. And as, I'm sorry, as you read through the book of Acts, I meant to say you'll find this to be true. Well, the second part of the lesson we find that uh, the consequences of denying that there is a resurrection. Now that Paul has proved the resurrection of Christ, and he's well proved it here with, uh, with uh, over 500 witnesses, he said, or those who saw Christ after his resurrection, the fulfillment of the prophecy, and the apostles then uh, had all witnessed it and all preached it. So he's 
very well proved the resurrection of Christ, and he then goes on to show there will be a general resurrection as a result of that. So the question that he's asking them, if Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the very thing on which your faith is built, because that's the gospel, that's what I preach to you, the thing on which the church is built, why are you denying it? Notice what he says in verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached and he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? Why are you putting your Greek philosophies into the gospel? It's one of the things he's asking. And so he asks, after he asks this question, he gives six consequences of denying that there would be a resurrection. As we look down through these verses, we can see these consequences. In verse 13, he says, if there is no resurrection, then Christ was raised. Now, he had just proved Christ was raised, and he said, but if there's no resurrection, then Christ wasn't raised either. In verse 13, he said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. So this is what he's, he's, he's proved it, but he's saying this is the consequence of not believing it. That Christ was not raised if there's no such thing as a resurrection. If there's no resurrection, then he said, your faith is vain, it's worthless. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Uh, we're, just, uh, we're just out here talking. It has nothing to do then with anything. It's just vain words. And then he goes on to say in the third one that... Uh, in, that Paul, including all these witnesses, these 500-some witnesses that he's talked about earlier, uh, who witnessed the resurrection, he said, then they're all false witnesses. All the apostles and myself are also false witnesses if this is the case. There's 15 and 16. Moreover, if we are even found to be false witnesses of God, because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ, whom if he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And so he keeps arguing against this. See, this is the consequence of not believing in a resurrection. Because if that's true, then Christ is not raised. And then all of these other things are true. Your faith is vain. We're false witnesses. And then he goes on to say, there's no forgiveness of sins, if that's the case. In verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And then he talks about those who had become Christians and then had passed on. He said, then these folks have no hope. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished then. Uh, they're just gone. They have no hope of resurrection if there is no resurrection. And then he said, most of all, Christians are to be the most pitiful group of people on the face of the earth if there is no resurrection in verse 19. For if we have hoped in this in Christ, in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. You remember in one place Paul talked about all the suffering uh, that he had done as a result of his uh, preaching the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And many of the Christians had suffered greatly and would in the future. In fact, the second and third centuries Christians suffered greatly because they believed in Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. But even at that time, many had lost their jobs. Some of them had to go hungry. Some were beaten and shunned and suffered all kinds of horrible deaths as you move on into the future. Uh, and for all for a false hope of being resurrected to live eternally with Christ if there was no resurrection. So he said all of these things, too, these are the consequences of not believing in a resurrection. And yet, there are many today who believe that some of the Bible is true, that it is great to have these teachings of Jesus, that it will help the world if we go by these teachings of Jesus, and it certainly will, but that there really is nothing after that. There is no virgin birth. There is no uh, resurrection of Christ but his teachings are just good philosophy to go by. They fail to recognize all of these consequences that Paul talked about. Paul certainly gave ample proof that there will be a resurrection. How do you argue with over 500 witnesses? 
What do you do whenever you have a trial, say somebody is killed, somebody's murdered or something, and you want to prove that some person did it? You go and you gather and say, how many witnesses do we have that saw this person kill this person? And they bring in all the witnesses and all the evidence they can find. Now, if they've got witnesses, that is the main source they will rely on. So witnesses are very important. And here, Paul had over 500 that he talked about. In dealing with the consequences of denying the resurrection, Paul shows just how important the resurrection really is. He said, if there is no resurrection, Christ was not raised, and then our faith is useless. All the witnesses of the resurrection then were just lying. And there's no forgiveness of sins if there was no resurrection. The dead in Christ have no hope, and those who are still living are people to be pitied because we believe a lie and sometimes suffer as a result of it, and there will just be no benefits then for all these things that we go through living for Christ here on this earth. And you know, that makes the resurrection very, very important. Now, the question I want to leave with you this morning is, will you be ready when that resurrection takes place? And is it possible that you could be denying the resurrection not by going out and saying, no, I don't believe in a resurrection like some of the folks were at Corinth, but by denying it by the kind of lifestyle that you live? Oh, you can say, well, I believe there's going to be a resurrection, but the kind of lifestyle you live may say, well, it's not important. I'm just going to live like I want to live. The judgment will come immediately after the resurrection. In Revelation chapter 20, in verse 11, it talks about this judgment and the resurrection. And he said, I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death in Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So the most important question, whenever we come to the resurrection and the books are rolled out, is, is my name written there in one of those books in the book of life? Now, the Bible will be there, and the record of your life and my life will be there, and it'll be compared. Did I live by the word that God gave? And if I obey the gospel, then my name will be written in that book. But it is possible for it to be erased out of that book if I... Start well and end badly. You see, in Revelation 3 and verse 5, as Jesus wrote to Sardis, he said, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. So the important thing is that our name be written there. In fact, that'll be the most important thing that we can find out when we stand before Christ in the resurrection. Is my name written there? If your name is not there, or if your name has been erased, and you think so because of the scriptures, then I encourage you to do something about it. And we'll help you in any way we can as we stand and sing an invitation song.